So welcome to the Teaching with Historia webinar. Um, I am your co-host, Kate Riley. I'm here from Eline Media, where Historia is made. I'm here with uh, Steve, who does quality assurance for uh, Historia. And then um, last, but certainly not least, I'm uh, virtually co-hosting with Jason Darnell, who joins us from Houston. Jason, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Darnell. I'm a creator of Historia. Uh, I've taught for 12 years. I created Historia for eight years while I taught. Uh, I'm just really excited to give everyone insight on how to use this in the classroom as a teaching tool. Wonderful. Um, so today we're uh, going to go over how to use Historia as a teaching tool. Previously, we came together to talk about setup. It was a very nuts and bolts, technology-centered conversation. Um, but today, we're really going to talk about how to use it in their classroom and how to get started with it um, from an application. So today, we're going to go over some of the big picture things in Historia. Historia is a game-infused curriculum. And so like a lot of games, there are rules and core mechanics that you have to know before you can get started with it. But once you know those rules and mechanics, you can snap into it and play it easily anytime. And everybody knows all of the rules. Um, and then, uh, most exciting, we are going to play through a round of Historia. So my question today for you, Steve, is uh, are you ready to go head to head with me and the rest of the folks here in Epoch so. 1? I think so. All right, well, let's, we'll see what you've got. Um, OK, you so uh, yeah. So let's get started. And I want to say if anybody has any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, but because this is a Google Hangout, please mute yourself when you're not talking because the screen will go to you when, um, when you are talking. So I'm going to screen share for a little bit so we can get into uh, our presentation. And So Jason is going to start us off with uh, a little overview of Historia, and uh, I'll advance the slide, Jason, but the floor is yours. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, you know, when, when we decided to create his, Historia, uh, Rick and I wanted to create a, a, a game or a curriculum that you could play every day in your class. So... Um, Kate, can you mute your microphone or something? I, I don't see the slides. I just see you and Joe Biden. Oh, OK. Um, I'll do that. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So I still can't see it. OK. So um, what we decided, what we wanted to do is we wanted to create something that uh, was for teachers and to help teachers. So we wanted to create something that was elastic and flexible and could be built for any teacher's classroom or that a teacher could use their skills that they've honed over the years to improve the game uh, themselves. I know that um, there are many different ways to play Historia. Um, we'll talk about different options today as we play the game that I've found work really well in the class and then some that, that um, can, can improve the experience to, de depending on your technology you have in your class or number of students or time limit, things like that. Um, <clears throat> we also wanted the classroom to look like a regular classroom when we created it, so you'll see that your classroom looks like a, a regular uh, classroom of today, meaning that kids are going to be collaborating at tables, um, kids are not going to be locked behind a screen, the tablet's simply going to be a dashboard or, or the laptop's simply going to be a dashboard that then the students can input their research and decision-making uh, information into. So, so Rick and I are really, really excited uh, about the potential for Historia. Really, really excited that you guys have, have uh, are here to be a part of it. I do want to mention one thing that 
that what you're seeing is is our, our minimal viable product. And what's really exciting about this is that you guys are going to have a chance to help shape this game into what it needs to be. Um, so I encourage your input. I, I would love to hear the way you've solved problems in your class. Um, I know, Amanda, already you've, you've, you've talked about how you've created stations at your group, uh, at your table, so that kids can uh, use the uh, laptop more efficiently and there's not like a log jam when you're creating budgets. I think that's a great idea and that's exactly the type of stuff that Kate and I are ready to listen to as we go through this um, and uh, as the beta goes on. Um, yeah, you want to go to the next slide, Kate? Great. So, Jason, as long as you're talking, um, the screen is going to go um, to you. And so, if you find a way to, I fixed um, it. you fixed it. Yeah, I fixed it. Okay, great. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I guess where Rick and I started is we thought, okay, here's what we have to teach. How are we going to teach everything we're supposed to teach? in this game-infused curriculum. So, so we decided that the game should start in 2000 BCE, end in 2000 CE. It's going to cover 4,000 years of history, and um, you're going to be able to connect the present to the past. So that was really, really important to us. Uh, the, the rounds of play are called epochs. So uh, history is made up of several rounds of play. Uh, the a game turn is called an epoch, where the student groups will, will make decisions as a government and, and interact with, with, a cult, with one of the cultures of that epoch. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thanks. So, so what Historia will do, and what Rick and I have really noticed, is that it turns the teacher into what you've always wanted to be, which is, which is an advisor, which is a counselor, which is a, someone that's there, like Socrates, just to ask questions. Uh, you're not the center of information anymore. You are, you are there to be the guide. Um, the students are in charge of their learning with this. Uh, each student will have a chance to become their own leader at least once throughout the year. It's a very, very powerful thing. I know as teachers you have students in your class that you wish you could reach or that you wish could be inspired to really show you what they can do. In Historia, it's shocking to watch a student be forced into a leadership position and, and, and watch how they blossom. It's, it's amazing to see. Uh, it's inspiring. You see students that you had never seen before, and it allows you to really reach those kids that you've had a hard time reaching. Um, and so what's going to happen is that in, the, in these collaborative groups the students form of four to six, they are a government. And that leadership will change depending on what Historia does or depending on um, what decisions the government makes. So at least Every, every student in the group should be a leader at least once throughout the year, at least. You want to continue, Kate? Awesome. Um, so, sure. So, so um, we decided that in order for students and their governments to really, really have ownership in this material and really uh, want to dive into it, we decided that students should have different roles in their government. So you have an economy minister that uh, manages the means to produce what your people need to survive. You have an exploration minister, a uh, science and technology minister, a public works minister, a military minister, and an education minister. These students will be experts in these fields, so whenever the head of the government needs advice or needs to know which path they should choose in uh, preparing their, their, their government and their people, they can refer to these experts. Um, these students, we've witnessed, really, really feel uh, attached to these roles. Um, it makes them feel more attached to their group. It makes them feel like they're a part of a bigger whole, which is one of the themes we want to really promote in Historia, that, that we are just a part of a much bigger picture, uh, but that we're all interconnected, right? So, so we thought this would be the best way to do this. Um, it's, it's worked very, very well. Um, and this is the organized... I guess this is how the groups will be organized going forward in the process. Um, yeah, so Kate, you want to continue? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to take it from here? Yeah, I guess if you'd like, sure, go ahead. Great. So um, I just want to make sure that this is, um, that this is showing up on, it looks like this is not showing up. Um, 
Steve, I'm wondering if you can get me an Ethernet cord so that I can get a hard connection. Um, great. So it is. Hey, can, can you guys see this? Okay. Are folks able to... Are folks Jonas, able to... Steve, Amanda? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, you guys can see it. Okay, great. Um, fantastic. So, um, in each epoch, so, so as Jason was saying, um, students are leaders of their own civilizations. Students are working in teams to lead a civilization from Mesopotamia to modern times. Each student is a, an expert on one branch of government and one student will be the leader for each epoch and sometimes for a few consecutive epochs but as in life leadership and historia is always changing in every epoch which each will which will take place in a in a different period of time students have five missions um, we're gonna go quickly over those missions right now and then we're going to see how students are doing those missions as they play through the game, um, as we play through a game. So the first thing that they have to do is determine their location. In Historia, students are kids from the future who are uh, dropped into a place in ancient history. The very first thing they must do is figure out where they are and who they're going to face. The second uh, mission is that they have to develop their budget. In Historia, budgets are the way that we prepare to face threats and opportunities that come our way in a historical age. Mission three, we're selecting a budget. Um, so we may have come up with different recommendations about a budget. In mission three, we're finalizing on one budget. Mission four, we face the epoch. So we take our budget, we take all of our preparation, and we face the epoch. And then in mission five, we reflect upon the decisions that we made in the epoch through the perspective of people who might have lived in our civilization at the time. And so, so real quick, I just want to add on to what Kate said, that, that this is, th these budgets are ways for you to make sure you are keeping up with the historical times. Um, so you're being dropped into an age, and you need to research that age and find out what these, what advancements these civilizations that you might interact with ha have achieved themselves, and you're kind of preparing yourself to be as as prepared or as powerful or as uh, you know knowledgeable as these other cultures that you are interacting with, and how you prepare will determine if you're successful in interacting with this culture, whether it be war or a trade opportunity or it could be a public works building project, it could be anything that Historia throws at you. If you are a student or a teacher that knows the curriculum really well, and there are those students out there too, uh, they can pretty much predict what's going to happen. So what this does is this causes students to go home and research ahead of time. And you see that a lot. They'll go home and research their history book or online without you telling them to, just simply because they want to be really successful in the game. So it's, it's something that Rick and I didn't expect, but it's a, it's a great thing to, to, to have, it, I think. So, sorry, Kate, Absolutely. go ahead. Absolutely. It's an important thing to reinforce, that Historia is all about preparation and figuring out how you can prepare to meet a culture or to meet a historical event by analyzing how those other people that you're about to face prepared for similar threats and opportunities. So we're going to go quickly over these five missions here because we really want you to see them as we're playing, which is what we're going to do. As we go over these missions, we're going to focus on what is the teacher or facilitator doing, what is the student doing. So in mission one, students must determine their location. They must figure out where they are. This is the very first thing that you're going to do when you get into histori Historia. This is the teacher view that you see here. And here is where the teacher is presenting a dramatic reading of the background narrative by advancing the background screens. 
and then supporting students to complete the Mission One guide as a class or in teams, and then finally revealing the location. Um, students are first listening to the teacher present that background narrative and then closely rereading the background narrative and researching history to determine their location. Mission two, develop a strategy. So here, you'll be analyzing the threats and the opportunities that could come your way in the epoch, and you'll be deciding how can I prepare my civilization uh, by purchasing advancements on my tech tree to face that culture and to face our historical event. Um, and during mission two, the teacher is tracking student progress on the commit to record screen, so seeing who is um, where in terms of having purchased um, made their purchases for their civilization, uh, who's ahead, who's behind, and students are completing their research and then they're going to their tech tree and they're saying, okay, I think that we're going to encounter a military battle. So how can I prepare my military and then they're per making purchases on the tree? We're going to see exactly how this works in just a few minutes. Uh, mission three choose a strategy. So all of the students have done their research and either they've made recommendations um, on their digital tech tree uh, or they have just talked with each other about uh, what purchases they think would be advantageous and now they're ready to make final purchases. In Historia everyone has input into the um, into the budget, the leader makes the final decision. Um, hey, can, I, can I add real quick here? Absolutely. Um, sure. I just wanted to say that um, this is this is one of the parts of the game where we can really use uh, lessons from your experience. Um, you know, the, the kids the kids collaborating on this budget uh, is a really interesting part of the game. It could go really well if you're prepared and your students are prepared, or it could be a bit trying if you're not. So I'm interested to hear from your guys' experiences what worked best for you during this time. Um, does that make sense, guys? Right. Uh, I feel like I feel like what I'm most excited about with this hangout and, and the series of these hangouts here, these webinars, is that I get to hear from you guys and your experiences, and and really get to see what you guys are capable of with the game. All I know is what Rick and I have been able to do with it. Uh, there are much better teachers out there, and, and, and I'd like to hear about your experiences with it. Uh, sorry, Kate. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. I think that's a great, that's a great comment, and we'll really zero in to that moment that Jason is talking about when we play through. Um, finally, Wait, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's, 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 the, what's the digital tech tree that you mentioned earlier? We're going to see. So right after this, in, we are four slides away from actually playing through Historia, um, and we're going to see that firsthand. The digital tech tree is the center of Historia, um, and it's, it's like the nerve center of, of Historia. Um, so mission four, you've prepared your budget. Now it's time to face the epoch, to face the cultural encounter. The story continues. You figure out, did I prepare wisely or did I not? Um, at this point, the teacher is dramatically presenting the conclusion to the epoch. Uh, students are listening to the outcome and discovering how they did and, um, and how many points they earned to spend for next time. Um, and finally, in Mission 5, you reflect not only on the decisions you made, but how you made the decisions, um, and you reflect upon the result of the epoch through the perspective of the people in your, um, in your civilization. Um, at this point, the teacher is supporting students um, to, to do those reflections, and the students are doing the reflections. Before we move on to Historia, do we have uh, any questions? I have a quick question. Sorry. Hi, Susanna here. Um, Susanna? 
I just was wondering if the missions, do you plan it usually like a mission per lesson, or how do you, what's the pacing of this generally? Right. Well, pacing is one of the things that we're really interested in learning more about um, during the beta, but if you look at the, um, the, uh, game, the Game Master Guide that came out with the, uh, the live beta launch on Monday, the last six or seven pages of that is a pacing guide um, okay. that tells you about how long it's going to take to do each one of these missions and kind of walks you through the entire process that we're about to go through right now. And, and once, once again, I would just like to say that, that this pacing is really up to you as well because I, d I don't teach your children. I don't, I don't uh, have your time constraints or your classroom constraints or anything. So this, once again, this is one of those things where I would like to hear from, from you guys what you think the pacing should be and, how, and what's worked for you. Yeah, absolutely. And those are, that's one of the things we'll definitely be asking about um, when we do the, uh, the evaluations um, throughout and then post the beta. Um, okay, so great. Now, um, can everybody see the screen here? Um, hopefully folks can, can see the screen. I'm always a little confused, but um, I'll start anyway. So, I have the Teacher, I have the teacher um, application on my left. And on the right, I have the Historia student application. Um, I'm going to be running both, but of course, if I was the facilitator in a real classroom, I would be running the Historia teacher application, and then my students each would be running uh, the, uh, the Historia student application. Um, I have Steve over here who is going to be... Um, a team, and I'm going to play a team. So I am going to be Zach Attack 1, and... Um, I will be Zach Attack 2. Steve is going to be Zach Attack 2, okay? So I'm Zach Attack 1, um, but I'm also playing as the teacher. So I see that Zach Attack 2 has uh, logged in, and I know this because there is an orange ring around their team. So I'm going to get on Zach Attack 1, to uh, come over to their side here and to select their icon. Um, and now I see that once they mm -hmm. click on that, I have two rings around here, which means, yay, I can move on. Um, and... Great. So the first thing that I'm going to see is um, this culture screen here. Now in every epoch, there are three cultures of interest. And the very first thing that you need to do as a player in this game is figure out where you are and which of these cultures you're going to face. And as a teacher, I can use this nifty little hub here to um, give, some, give students some context about the cultures of interest that we're going to be dealing with. Um, and I can do that by navigating around the hub. So I can use these arrow keys here to go to uh, different cultures. And then I can use these uh, bubbles here, these icons, to bring up different information. You will see that as I make selections here uh, on the teacher side, that students see those same selections. So if the students are asking questions about these cultures, I can easily uh, bring up information from them. But you'll also see that they can control it too, but that doesn't control my screen. I, I um, really like that because it turns this into a classroom management tool where you don't have to, uh, you, know, you, know, you know where the kids are on their devices at all times because you're in charge of it. I, I like that a lot. That's right. Just, we had, that's okay. teacher talking over here. I'll, I'll be quiet. No, that's right. We had, uh, we had a couple people ask, well, what are the students supposed to do? How do they know what they're supposed to do when they get into the application? Um, and the really good way to think about it is that the teacher is running the progression of the screens. With the exception for, of the purchasing phase, um, 
the, the teachers are really running most of the action and it's really up to the students to do the research and then make the purchases. So I feel like we've, we've spent enough time um, going over these cultures. It's time to get into the epoch. And because I'm in the beta and because we don't have the ability right now to go backwards in this slide progression, which is something that will be fixed for fall, I'm going to hand out the Epoch 1 background to all of my students um, so that as I read this background to them, they can, um, they can follow along. Because it's going to be very important that they closely read and consider the text in the background that they're about to hear. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is go to, um, is hit this button here. And as soon as I hit that button here, we've begun mission one. We are now in mission one. And in mission one, as a student, I know I have to determine my location. Um, so as the teacher, I'm going to read through um, the uh, background here. And since we're all playing together, um, and also, Jason, since it seems like it pulls the screen away when others are talking, do you want me to just read through it? Uh, that'd be great, Kate. Okay, great. So I'm going to read this story. This is the story of your civilization. Um, we're all kind of playing together here, so we want to think about clues that would tell us where we are, okay? So civilizations began as tribes of nomadic hunter-gatherers. Under the guidance of a chieftain, these groups have lived in a constant hunt for enough food to survive during the Bronze Age. More and more of these tribes change their traditional lifestyle and consolidate into larger civilizations. People begin developing sciences and technologies, such as irrigation canals and agriculture, which allows them to settle near large water sources. There, they are able to cultivate a renewable source of food. And I'm just going to be uh, hitting these arrow keys in the upper right-hand corner to move forward. After leaving your arid mountain home, which was plagued with drought, your tribe has found land between two great rivers. The fertile soil and hot climate holds great potential, promising many resources and bountiful harvests if your people can learn to use the cycles of floods and the extreme climate to their benefit. If tamed, this land could support your people for generations to come. Your society has an opportunity to use this land to establish a firm foundation for growth if your people can remain unified while they transform and protect this land. They have a chance of constructing a great and powerful civilization. However, other civilizations have been working this fertile but challenging land for generations and may not be eager to share this territory. So the very first thing that I want my students to do is to figure out where they are. Um, and if I feel like I want to give them a little scaffolding in terms of um, in terms of helping them use research to inform their decision, then I can give them the Mission 1 guide here. And the Mission 1 guide is going to help them identify some background clues. So can anybody, uh, either in voice or in the chat, um, maybe recall some background clues that, would, uh, that are highlighted here? Uh, that would help a young person understand where they were? Geography terms? I think, I think it's important that we understand that this document here, what, what we wanted to create was something that would be helpful, not like, a, not like hey kids, here's a worksheet you have to do over, the, over what we just read, but more it's a, a guide to assist them in figuring out what they need to figure out. Um, and so I think there's a lot of big clues here, like Bronze Age and uh, definitely the land found between two great rivers. Uh, when, you're, when your only choices are China, mound builders, or Iraq, it seems like there's only one, one choice there, correct? 
Right, so Sujata says, they're between two liver, uh, rivers, the land is fertile, uh, the river floods. Um, so that's exactly it. And the major clue here is the arid climate, uh, fertile land, and uh, two rivers which are known to flood. And um, and so, of course, that is, does anybody have any, um, have any guesses between China, uh, Iraq, and United States of America, which one we might be talking about? United States. <laughs> Great. Um, well, with a little research, actually, um, many young people are able to identify the Tigris and Euphrates River in what used to be the Mesopotamian Valley. Um, most textbooks will tell you that those rivers had flooding cycles. Um, and the early people settled between those two rivers where there once was fertile land. Um, and so they'll go through a process of ruling out the others. Um, they make a guess about where they are. And then uh, the teacher, at that point, you would announce, um, yes, you are in um, the Mesopotamian Valley. Your culture that you are going to encounter is Sumer. And with everybody having that knowledge that they're going to encounter the Sumerian, uh, that they're going to encounter the Sumerians, we can move on to mission two, um, which is really researching and deciding how we're going to purchase. And real, real quick, I would just like to. Yeah. I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like this is another place for for teacher freedom, where if you feel like this document isn't necessary and you could have a classroom conversation about this where you do you know a uh, kind of question and answer hey let's highlight some let's highlight some clues and go around the class or pair share all your different techniques I would love to I would love to hear how those went and I'd love to see which you were most successful with I don't want you to feel like you're locked in to these documents simply because uh, I, I I know you you know you, you you can't really tell it. You can't really give a teacher something and say, "Hey, do the, do exactly this, right?" Uh, you guys do things differently. So I, I'd like to I'd like to just hear that feedback. That's all, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so now the moment that everybody has been waiting for um, the the purchase phase. So the idea here is that um, students would uh, look again at the background and. Um, so Sujata says, I think it would be really fun for kids to use this as a way to map the world's major river systems. Absolutely. Um, and that first, yeah, and that, that's a really interesting idea. Um, so, so this is the part where um, young people are going into the system. They're thinking about what are the threats and opportunities uh, that we could face in this epoch, and um, and how can I prepare for them? And in the Historia, you prepare for threats and opportunities by purchasing um, advancements on your tech tree. Um, so we're going to go into full screen here. Um, the important thing to know is that each student has the opportunity to recommend their own budget and they each have their own um, they each have the opportunity to enter the budget as um, as a different student so I could enter the budget as Kelly or as Jesse um, or as AC um, so let's enter as Jesse, who's the education minister, and I'm going to enter. And here, so this is the Historia Tech Tree here. And it looks pretty intimidating. Um, but this is what young people will see when they go into 
um, into the tech tree. Um, they can zoom in uh, by rolling the mouse and then they can zoom out here. And if they zoom in, they'll see, um, when they're zoomed out, they'll see all of these different branches. Um, and as they zoom in, they're going to see that each one of these nodes on these branches is a different icon. These icons are known as advancements. And each of these advancements has a price on it. So this is Stone Tools on the Science and Technology branch. Um, it is five culture points. And I can click here to find out some information about it. So um, up here in the upper left-hand corner, or the upper right-hand corner, is, um, is my hub that tells me how many points I have to spend and how many points I um, have spent so far. So right now, I have 200 points because in Historia, in the first epoch, every student starts out with 200 points. Um, so um, I can purchase things on the uh, tech tree just by selecting them here. Um, I can purchase, can select them. So there are <clears throat> um, a couple rules to the tech tree here. Um, number one, I, can, I must move chronologically. So that means that in order to buy the wheel, I have to buy stone tools. And in order to buy papyrus, I have to have bought the wheel. So I have to go in order. The second thing is requirements. And requirements are really one place where Historia shows the interconnectedness of all branches of governments. So say I want a calendar. Um, I'm, and I realize I see this red ring here. I try to click on it, but it doesn't allow me to click. That's my cue to press this um, question mark here. And I see that the cost is five culture points, so I can afford it. But the requirement is alphabet and education. So I'm going to close this out. I'm going to zoom up. I'm going to go over to education here. And I'm looking for alphabet, which is all the way down here. I have oral tradition already. I need to buy written language for 25 numerals for 25, then I can buy alphabet. Now let me return to the science and technology um, branch. And oh look, calendar, once surrounded by a red ring, is now surrounded by a blue ring, metallurgy, and so on. Um, so this is that is how the, the tech tree basically works. Before I go on to how students are using research to inform their purchase, does anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello to you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I want to ask you if all this, I want to ask you if all this uh, um, website is for free or do I have to pay in order to learn history? Yeah, we'll, we'll answer those kinds of questions at the end, OK? OK, um, sure. Yeah. So um, any other questions about how this works? I would just like to say, as, as, as a, a, the teacher creator here, that this is, one of the, this is the coolest part of the game to watch as a, as a, as a teacher and an educator. Because as Kate was saying, when, when the science and technology person gets to calendar, and they find out they can't buy it, then they have to talk to the person, they have to collaborate with the person that has the requirement they need to buy calendar in order to do it. So what this does is these interconnectivity of all these, all these uh, uh, kind of pillars of government, they, they force collaboration with the kids. Um, they, uh, and it, it, I guess it, it, it's just really cool to watch. They, they really involve, you see kids that don't get along talking to each other. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool to see. But go ahead, Kate. <clears throat> Great. So um, the idea is that students 
think about the um, students think about the risks and opportunities that they um, could face during an epoch, and then they make purchases that they feel could prepare them um, for those risks and opportunities. So I've just heard a story about my civilization in 3000 BC during the Bronze Age. I've heard that an opportunity that we have is fertile land. That's great. So let's see, fertile land, I'm definitely going to want to get a plow. That sounds like something that if I wanted to maximize the opportunity of fertile land, I'd want a plow. But in order to get a plow, I'm going to need agricultural revolution. That has a red ring around it. That means it has a requirement. Okay, so I'm going to click on that. It tells me what agricultural revolution is, and it tells me that in order to be able to innovate uh, agricultural revolutions, I'll first need to buy irrigation canals in public works. So I'm going to close that out, and then I'm going to go to public works over here, and I see the irrigation canals is the very first thing. That's great. Now I can go back to Agricultural Revolution, and I can buy that, and I can buy plow. Oh, and look, I'm going to buy a seed drill, too, because I think that's probably something um, that would help me, uh, you know, grow a farm. Um, what else would I need? Oh, I remember hearing something in that background narrative about a warring neighboring civilization who wanted my land. If that warring civilization wants my land and I don't feel like giving it up, then there's probably going to be a war and I'm going to need to be prepared for that. So I'm going to go over here to the military pillar and I'm going to buy stone weapons and I'm going to buy iron weapons. Why? Because I did my research and I realized that Sumerians had iron weapons. So if I show up with just stone weapons to that battle, they're going to beat me because they're going to have better weapons than I have. So I'm going to buy iron weapons too. Oh look, I'm getting down to 25. I don't have that more, many points to spend. Mm, I think I'll get a chariot too. And... Hmm... Uh, I'll get division of labor. Oh, I can't get division of labor because I only have 15 points left. Hmm... Maybe on the other hand I don't really... Um... So I think I'll get walled cities instead, and then I'll just have five points left over. Um, great. Now the game is asking me for something called a confidence interval. So there are two parts to mission four, uh, which is the reveal. Um, in mission four, there's also I'm also going to experience one of seven historical events. I know what I know what the historical events um, I know that there will be seven historical events. I know what those seven historical events will be. I just don't know which one my civilization is going to face. I know that it will be cuneiform, desertification, Beringia, or mound building, or cave painting, or Stonehenge, or agricultural revolution. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at how I've prepared, and I'm going to say, well, based on how I've prepared, based on what I've bought, how prepared would I be for any one of those? Well, I'm pretty well prepared on um, for something like cuneiform, Form because I have a lot in education, um, but I might not be prepared for Beringia, which is the Bering Land Bridge, because I don't have anything around exploration. So because I'm really prepared for some things and not prepared on other things, I'm going to choose a 7 to represent my confidence going into this epoch. So as the education minister, those are my picks. Um, but the leader has the final decision. So now as the teacher, I've advanced to the leadership purchase. Right Now we're moving into mission three. 
Mission three is when you are going to take the input from all of the ministers and make one decision about one budget. Um, as the teacher, I'm watching for uh, how people, how my teams are progressing. And now, um, Jesse. Jesse is the um, is the leader here. And now, as I go in to the tech tree, I can see the icons. I can get a sense of how all of the other ministers recommended that we prepare because I can see little icons next to each one um, of the advancements. Um, so so does, that, does that little book does that little book there, Kate, what that book does is that says the education minister has said that they suggest that you purchase these things? Precisely. Okay, so if it was like the science and technology minister, it would be the little atom. That's right. So I only did, uh, I only went through as one minister because we don't have a lot of time, but um, you may choose to have all students do their recommendations and then, um, and then you would see the icons uh, next to, you would see all of the icons uh, next to each of these uh, advancements. So as the leader, I'm going to go in and make final decisions. And you'll see that as I make decisions here, there is a little crown on top of the decisions that I make. Um, so again, calendar. In order to get calendar, I have to go to education. And uh, that was this. And I'm going to go rogue here a little bit. And I think we need that. Definitely want to prepare for a military encounter here and iron weapons. So I've spent all of my money. By checking this box, it means it's a final decision. So um, I'm logging in. Uh, I agree with the education minister that our confidence level is seven. Yeah. And I'm going to pick a lucky number. Yeah. So now as the teacher, I'm seeing that all of my teams have um, committed their, uh, have, have done their leader purchase, they've finalized their budgets, and now I'm ready to move on to mission four. Before I move on to mission four, does anybody have any questions? Good wait time, Kate. I think we're good. Great. Okay, so now it's time to move on to mission four. Mission four is um, where students learn, the story continues, and students learn what their fate is. They learn what happens to their civilization, and they learn whether or not they prepared wisely for the cultural encounter. Because we're a little low on time, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase, but this is the same thing as the background where you as a facilitator are reading this, and students are, um, are, are listening and following along on their, uh, on their hub here. But now both screens look the same. Um, what this story tells you is that the Sumerians are indeed covetous of your land and they are indeed going to wage war on you to try to take your land away. Um, and, but what you learn is that their military might uh, is not only uh, having to do with... Um, is not only because of their investment in military, but because they have strong agriculture and they have strong public works. So all of those things are connected. Um, here is where students learn 
which areas, which branches were most important and they learn um, the comparison between how the culture that they're going to encounter was prepared and how their own culture was prepared. What I need to do as a team is to be equally as prepared or better than the culture which I am encountering in all of the uh, branches that are compared. So, in economy, um, the Sumerians have 25. Um, my culture has 25. Zach Attack 2 has zero. They didn't make any purchases in economy. So when it comes to economy, they are not as prepared. But I am equally as prepared, so I win that comparison. Um, in government, uh, the Sumerians are 25, and both Zack Attack 2 and Zack Attack 1 are 25. Um, in military, they are 30, um, Zack Attack 2 is 10, and um, regular Zack Attack is 20. And then in science and technology, um, they... Uh, uh, the Sumerians are 50, Zack Attack is 70, and Zack Attack 2 is 25. So that means that um, the score of the Sumerians is 130. Team uh, Zack Attack 2 has 60 because they spent most of their points on pillars that were not crucial in this time. And uh, Zack Attack... Um, one has 140. So that means that Zack Attack is a winner, which means they get to keep their land. And um, Zack Attack 2 was not successful in this epoch, which means they will probably um, lose their land. Okay. So there's an opportunity for a power up here. Um, So, uh, Jason, do you want to explain the way that the hinge works here? Right. So, so Rick and I included the hinge into the game because we feel like uh, you know history is a great, uh, the greatest story ever told, really. Uh, and the textbooks seem to treat it with no vibrancy whatsoever and and no real, uh, um, I guess, fun. So, what what Rick and I tried to do is we tried to find stories in history or or small little seeds in history that have had huge effects on on. Uh, on different events in history. So what the hinge is going to do, the hinge is going to teach that there are uh, intended and unintended consequences for everything you do in your life. Uh, Ninurta, the god of war, is just one of those examples. I'll just tell you the hinge really quick of Ninurta, the god of war, because we're on a time limit. But, um, you know, Ninurta, the god of war, is, is, is the war god for the Sumerians. So the way this hinge plays out is we, we tell a story of your people, like your own people, the students' people, uh, worship this winged lion, um, and they, they carve it on all of your shields, on, on all of your swords and your helmets, and when you approach the Sumerians on the battlefield, they see this winged lion, but they see it as a symbol of their god of war, and they see it as a symbol that this god of war favors you instead of them. So many, many of these Sumerian warriors on the battlefield will flee in terror just simply because you're people like a winged lion. You had no intention of, of scaring them with this winged lion, but it just so happens that this is their, their symbol for their war god. So it doesn't give you a clear victory in the game, but what it does is it gives you a power-up. Like it gives you a, a literally what it does, it gives you a 25-point boost. So if you were really close and being victorious, this power up will will uh, make you victorious. Um, it's it's a really fun part of the game because the way that the hinge is revealed, the way you the way you find out if you want it is simply like a lottery. You are you are uh, you you pick lucky numbers. The the game picks one of those numbers from a random gener generator, and if your number is drawn, then this hinge story becomes your people's story, and it gives you a twenty five point boost. Um, other hinges in the game revolve around 
uh, Operation Valkyrie in World War II. It could revolve around the Zimmerman Note in, in World War I. It could revolve around uh, the assassination of George Washington. It could revolve even around uh, St. Francis of Assisi. So th there are lots of different hinges in the game for each round that, that really add fun kind of storytelling and vibrancy to the game, and it's, it's one of the kids' favorite parts. Awesome. Great. So as Jason said, if this story becomes your story, you get the power-up. Um, if it does not, then you don't. There's really no way to prepare for this. This is really just kind of a fun thing in the game that um, gives students an opportunity to catch up and also exposes them to a little-known story in history. So you advance this part as the teacher by just pressing uh, click here to spin. And uh, it was, the number was 24, um, and no team, no team won. Um, so in the future, students will have opportunities to select more uh, than just one lucky number. So the, uh, the likelihood of students winning the hinge becomes greater as the game goes on. But today, nobody won. And so, right, the more the, go ahead. The more successful you are in the game, the more lucky numbers you'll have. Uh, you gain lucky numbers from gaining colonies. You gain lucky numbers from gaining cultural artifacts. So the more you participate in the game and, and, and explore different pathways, the more you're going to be rewarded. Great. So in this case, uh, nobody won the hinge, so the uh, comparison is, um, is unchanged. The postscript, so basically what this says is that if your civilization's uh, total meets or exceeds the needed in economy, government, military, and science and technology, then you defeat the Sumerians and you get to keep your land. Um, your civilization gets ziggurats because um, they absorb the culture of the Sumerians. Yeah, one of the things we wanted to focus on is that when two cultures collide, there's an exchange of culture. And so um, you achieving all these artifacts as you encounter different cultures is, uh, is, is really important to kind of building, building your own uh, story and your own culture. At the, at, the, at the end of this game, at the end, at the end of the year in May, your students will have created their own civilization and culture that's a mixed mash of everyone they've interacted with. So go, okay, I'm sorry. Um, if you did not um, win the comparison, so for Zack Attack 2, then you lose your land, and, um, and then this also means that leadership will transfer to another student in the class. Uh, there's an opportunity to earn additional points in the next part of the reveal, which is the historical event. So in the cultural encounter, all of the teams met the same cultural encounter. All of the teams met the Sumerians in the same cultural encounter. Here, each team um, will face a different historical event. So why don't you um, come over uh, to here? So as the teacher here, um, each team the leader on each team goes and um, selects a historical event. Um, so Zach Attack, which is my team, is uh, selecting first. And so I'm going to select number two. There's really no way of knowing which uh, event is behind any of these um, any of these numbers here, so it's very random. The teacher confirms the selection, and my event says, for years your government has been dedicated to the development of written language. Um, the development of cuneiform, the first ever written language, marks a major milestone in your people's history. So cuneiform is now something that has happened to my civilization. Now remember when I um, selected that confidence number, I selected seven, 
this is a positive event which is associated with a positive 4. Um, so I will get 4 times 7, 28. So that's 28 extra points for me because I got a positive event by luck. Um, I was confident and because I have written language. Um, and written language changed the modifier on this event from 2 to 4. Um, So I get cuneiform under my culture pillar, under music and literature. And that's me for the historical event. Now, the second team in my class needs to pick. Zach Attack 2. So Zach Attack 2, what number is it going to be here? Well, I wanted to select 2, but since you already selected it, I'll go with 7. <laughs> okay, so going to 7. And then confirm selection here. Okay. So for centuries, your people have lived as nomads, um, migrating from one place to another, following herds of wild game. Eventually, your people find undiscovered land bridge that links their land to a whole new continent. Um, reap the reward. So here is another positive... A uh, historical event. Let's see what number it's associated with and see what the confidence number for uh, Zach Attack 2 was. Your historical event modifier is plus 3, but if you have uh, developed exploration by land, your historical event modifier is increased by 4. So back when we were doing the purchases, Zach Attack 2 had developed exploration by land. Their confidence number was 9, which means 36 extra points for this team. Uh, mass migration is added to their culture pillar under rituals and traditions. And that's the end of mission 4 and the end of the reveal. In first place is Zack Attack. Um, their purchasing power for next time is 128. Um, and then second is um, Zach Attack 2. Their purchasing power, what they'll have to spend for next time, is 111 points. Does anybody have any questions about the end of, um, the, end of the reveal, the end of Mission 4? All right. Um, then you would advance, and it would take you into the beginning of Epoch Two. So you would start. You'd start from the beginning there of Epoch Two. Um, the final step here is the reflection. Um, this is an opportunity for um, for students to. Uh, consider the outcome of their uh, civilization from the perspective of their people. And to give a voice to their people, um, we have graphic organizers that, um, that support this, but this is obviously something um, that could be done freestyle. Um, so we just we just thought that it, it's important that the students reflect from from different voices in their civilization so they understand how history is told from different biases um, and how one event could look great to one social class while an, the same event could be a complete catastrophe to another. Um, we think that's very important. Great. So that's why we chose to have that reflection piece. Um, fantastic. So does anybody have um, any questions about uh, what we've talked about today? Okay, great. Well, in that case, I think we're going to wrap it up um, since we're about seven minutes over and we definitely wanted to keep this to... Um, 
and we definitely wanted to keep this to an hour. Um, so this will be going, of course, on YouTube immediately after this broadcast, and we will be sending out the link to everybody. And just as we did last time, we'll be hosting a discussion on the Google Hangout page. So if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to put them there. Um, great. And we'll be reaching out in the next few days with uh, more lesson plans, more education support. Uh, just want to call out that we have the Historia support line at Historia underscore support at elinemedia.com. And we also um, have our phone number, which is on the emails that we've been sending out. We thank so, everybody so much for their participation, and we really look forward to working with you and your students on this next exciting phase of Historia's development. Um, and we'll talk to you soon. Jason, do you have last words? No, I was just it's just great to, to hang out with you guys and talk to you guys and see so many teachers that are uh, inspired by this and, and want to want to do well with it and use it. I think it's cool. Great. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye bye.